Would you all pray with me? And I'm going to be guiding us in prayer uh, using Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at the heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beast of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And Jesus, we acknowledge this morning, Father, we acknowledge this morning the goodness of your creation. It's a demonstration of your power and your might. But also, Lord, we acknowledge it's a demonstration of your goodness. And Lord, we, we think of ourselves who, who, to whom you have entrusted the stewardship and care of your creation, the significance that you have bestowed on us in how you created us. And Lord, we, we, we come to you this morning recognizing fully the depth of our failure to be faithful stewards as you have intended. But we look this morning to the man, Jesus, to whom this psalm ultimately spoke, the one who rightfully and, and rightly has and will reign over all creation. And I pray this morning as we look at 1 Corinthians, a passage which has caused me some lack of rest. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you will work powerfully through the faithful preaching of your word to challenge us to understand more fully who you have created us to be and the implications of that for your glory and the good of your people. We pray all this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I came in just after Mark welcomed you and did announcements, and so I think you talked about prayer. Yep. Yes, tomorrow night and, and, and 6 o'clock. And I, I just want to affirm, and I, I've said this other times when I've talked about our, our Monday evening prayer gatherings. We do it the second Monday of every month. Can I ask by show of hands, who of you in recent times have worried about the state of our nation, our city, our, 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 our state? Has anyone had concerns about that? Who then has had worries or concerns about the state or well-being of the church and our church? Any hands raised there? A few less? That's... Probably a positive, I think. If you fit into those categories, then coming together to cry out to the Lord is the place for you. If you don't fit into that, those categories, still coming together and crying out to the Lord is the place for you. But guys, those Monday nights, we started as we entered into this season and we've kept them going because, guys, it's so important that we cry out to Him. And if we're feeling the burdens of, of not only the things going on in our country, not only the things going on in our church, but just life, those burdens are reminders to us of our need for God. And so there's no more clear an expression of that neediness than when we get together and just cry out to Him. So it is my heartfelt encouragement to you to join us tomorrow night. And we, we, we sing a little bit, we pray together, we, we usually are guided by a passage in the Bible, um, but we just... We call out to God. And I, I would encourage you, you know, if you can, there may be things you ought cancel to be there. Um, or if you don't have anything go, going on, to, to join us. Because it is, it is good for us to remember how it is important it is that we're calling out to the Lord. And sometimes life invites us to forget that. And so, so I just wanted to encourage you and reiterate what we talked about there. Uh, and, and then I want to talk about our passage. We're in 1 Corinthians 11, mainly focuses on verse 2 to 16. Um, and Tim gave me permission to do this a few weeks ago to kind of throw him under the bus. He's not here, and not only is he not here, but he skipped this passage last week and has me preaching on it this week. Now, that's because we do communion the first of the month and the following passage is on communion. But still, I can't help but feel a little bit harmed. <laughs> 
in having to preach this passage this morning. And, and I will tell you, I, I said this to somebody before the service, Grant, I think it was time to you, but, but I have not, in, in my memory as a pastor and in preparing sermons, which I don't do every week, I have not wrestled with a sermon like I have wrestled with this sermon. I've been reading for weeks on this. And I've been trying to read various opinions, various topics on it. Now, crazy thing, two weeks ago, we happened to be out at Fort McCoy. And if you don't know this, the Sparrow's Nest, an organization we've partnered with and, and we've taken advantage of their ministry, they have been housing for months um, uh, Mennonite groups who have been on Fort McCoy serving with, with the guests or refugees who are there in, in the process of being relocated. So here I am thinking about the passage of head coverings, and we spent four days a couple weeks ago out at McCoy. Who am I serving with but a number of these Mennonites who are there serving? Great people, and we had great conversations. And I quite boldly said, hey guys, in two weeks I'm preaching on a passage that is freaking me out. Tell me about head coverings from your perspective. It, we had some great conversation. They, they verbalize it in something called the headship order. One of them even like linked me a podcast that I never had a chance to hear um, to, before getting ready. But, but, but needless to say, I've been trying to take in various opinions, different perspectives, because my, my desire this morning is to be faithful to what God intended through the author Paul. That's what it means to preach. Not to give you my opinions, not to tell you what we think culturally, but to faithfully communicate what the Spirit inspired Paul to write. That's really hard when it comes to this. But I've got to tell you that the most significant book I read in preparing to preach this passage was not on this topic. I read a short book by John Piper on preaching. And, and John Piper, if you know anything about him, is a man whose mission, whose ministry, whose desire to communicate has been all about the glory of God. And in this little short book he wrote on preaching, one of the calls he had in it was to invite the pastor to remember that their mission in preaching is to present, as the church gathers, a beautiful and compelling picture of who God is, that we might savor, that we might desire Him. And so I began to pray in reading that, God, how, however I come to understand, and again, it's not what I understand, but, but as I wrestle with this text, whatever God you intend to communicate through Paul writing 11, 2 to 16, may I present it in such a way that you are made more beautiful, that you are glorified in our understanding of what you have to say to us in chapters 11, verses 2 to 16. But I had to look no further than the preceding passages to realize that that already was an important part of Paul's mission. For if we go back into chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians 11, and if you have a Bible with titles, you know we're dealing with head coverings. If you don't have a Bible with title, we're dealing with head coverings. Um, it's, it's great. Um, but, but, but right before, verse 31 of chapter 10, he says, So whatever you do, eat or drink, whatever, do it all to the glory of God. Like, guys, anything we do, the ultimate purpose behind it, the ultimate direction of it, is always the glory of God. That's it. That's it. And one of the things that happens when we live for the glory of God, we automatically are not going to be living for the glory of self. So when we glorify God, it puts us, maybe in a background sort of way, it puts us in conflict with another desire that rages in our sinful hearts, and that's the glory of self. So everything we do is for the glory of God. And then if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. One of the commentators I read was John Calvin. Listen to what John Calvin said about this verse. I love it, and remember that back in the day we think they talked nicer than we do today. From this it appears how absurdly chapters are divided. And as much as this sentence, disjoined from what goes before, with which it ought to have been connected, and is joined to what follows, which, which it has no connection. Now, 
we know that the chapters and verses in the Bible were not put there by the people who wrote them. So, so Paul did not break up 1 Corinthians by chapter and verse. That was done at various points in history. It, the first time it was done in the 13th century, there's a couple of guys who were part of it then. And then what we have today, where it gets down to the verses, was put in in the 15th century. One by an English guy, and then a, a French guy was involved as well. And I, I'd heard in seminary a joke about this, that these men worked while riding in their carriages on bumpy roads. And sometimes where they meant to put the verse or where they meant to put the division, they just missed. And this verse is often assumed to be one of the cases. But what if, what if Calvin was wrong? What if this doesn't display how stupid somebody was when they divided Romans 11.1 1 from Romans 10, but instead was actually an insightful reminder that Paul himself was not working with divisions. Paul himself was meaning to write a cohesive argument and so our desire to imitate Paul as he imitates Christ is very much a part of how we're supposed to understand what we read and what's to come. So these two principles are still at work. Imitate Paul as he imitates Christ, and everything we do, including imitating Christ, we do for the glory of God. So our ongoing pursuit of Christ's likeness, our passion to see the goodness of God and the name of Jesus on the minds and mouths of all people. With that in mind, let's read together 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 2. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Now, if you guys are reading NIV, we've already come into conflict, and we've already jumped into the debate that surrounds this passage. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 2, I'm going to breeze over quickly, is, is, is essentially this. Paul trying to do what we learn to do in coaching. Whenever you have something negative day to say, try and start with something positive. Hey, great job at this. Now, we want to work on... And, and he's, he's moving to sort of a new point in his letter, addressing some new topics. And he starts with, hey guys, you're doing great. And I'm thankful that you remember me. I'm thankful that you remember the traditions I passed on. But now we're getting to problems. And don't you get sick of when coaches clearly do that and you know the bad's coming? Just, just, just say it. Like, don't start with the superficial good just to get to the bad. But, but he does that. He said, hey guys, I'm thankful for your posture towards me. You're remembering of me. But, but let's remember this. Three statements. And in the Greek, it could be read this way. The NIV translates it this way. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman, man. Head of Christ, God. Any questions? Any questions? What is Paul talking about? Now, realistically, the Greek here is appropriately translated man or woman, husband or wife. The words are the same. So as English readers, we have to try and get to, to what he's talking about. Question one. What does Paul mean by head? Guys, as I read about this passage, there is so much debate about what Paul meant by using the term head. In what way are, are these ones heads of the others? An, another great question to ask is, is why this list? Why every man, Christ, man, woman, Christ, God? Three questions. Now, the first one I'm going to kind of breeze over quickly. As, as you heard in what I read, which is the English Standard Version, their understanding is that this is a reflection of what's communicated in Ephesians 5. And yet, I think the NIV is on to something because as you read through the rest of this passage, it is clear that all of this is not simply about husbands and wives. So there are principles here about manhood and womanhood that extend universally whether or not a person is married. And so I think the NIV has a good point. And yet I think headship, as we talk more about it in a minute, does apply in unique ways to husband and wife, that it doesn't apply to every man and every woman. And I think that's good to remember. Now, what does Paul mean by head? There's a couple of different options. Does he actually mean that men are physically women's heads? That Christ is physically our head? That's an easy one to answer. But then some other options become, is, is, is the term head used by Paul to symbolize source. In the way that you might say, this is the head of the river. It flows out from here. Or as some would argue, headship connotates 
authority. And so there's an authoritative structure in Paul's use of head. Can you see already why this is so hard? I do. <laughs> Guys, the first one I put there just to be funny. He's not talking about men are physically heads. God is physically the head of Christ. Christ is physically the head of women. But the second does have some strength to being understood in that way. Colossians 1.18, it talks about Christ being the head of the church. He is the firstborn from the dead. But then it also says that in everything he might be preeminent. And later on it says that Jesus Christ is the head of all rule and authority, Colossians 2.10. And also, as we get going in this passage, verses 7 to 9, 11 to 12, clearly refer back to the fact that woman was created from man. So there's, there's, there's implication of source in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. But I have a question to ask about it merely meaning source. If Paul merely means source, what are the implications of man being the source of woman? What does it matter that women were created from man way back at creation today? What's he drawing from the creation account? Now, the argument for authority clearly comes because in Ephesians 5, 1 Timothy 2, Paul, from the creation account, does imply or draw implications of authority in the roles of manhood and womanhood. I think that's clear. And even people who don't like manhood and womanhood in the Bible still see authority in those passages. And another issue we see is, is, is this is going to come into play in verse 10. Authority is in this passage. And I would also argue that, that the implication of authority is present in two out of the three of those for sure. So none of us would say that Christ being the head of all men doesn't have implications of authority. Now, interestingly enough, though, I think there is an argument to source in there, too, because Christ is not actively in authority all because not all submit to his authority. But it clearly, we would not argue, I hope, sitting in here, that Christ does not have an authoritative headship over all men. Secondly, insofar as Christ became a man, we see in John's gospel that Jesus clearly understood his role as being lived out in authority to the Father. Again and again, when we preached through John a few years ago, you saw it played out over and over that Jesus said, everything I do, I do because he tells me. Everything I say, I say because he tells me. And so two out of the three of those, there's clear inferences of authority. So would it make sense that in the third, that men are the head of women, that authority is at least somehow implied as well there? So, so that's my argument there. But I think it's also fair to say that just men or the head in authority over women is not the final goal of this passage. And I think that the headship used in verse 3 has connections, implications for both source and authority. Now why this list? And, and I know we're beleaguering this verse, but remember, this verse is a statement out of which everything else is drawn. Why the list? First of all, I don't think the list is an organizational chart for the church and world. God, Christ, man, woman. That's not what I think it is. But instead, I think there are examples here of relationships where authority is present. And those examples are, are listed both to remind us that we are under authority, but also to give us examples of rightly lived under authority. So men, remember that you are under the authority of Christ. Women, remember that you were created uniquely in ways to live under the authority of manhood. But remember, God is in authority over all, but even Christ who was God, Philippians verse 2, which we almost read in prayer this morning. Philippians verse 2. Though he was equal with God, did not equal, or consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so we see both reminders of the fact that, that relationships of authority exist and also examples of meaningful authority lived out in our world. But there are problems. Because if we see only source in this, how is woman not from Christ? Does somehow woman have to be saved, reconciled to God, through Christ, through man, to her? 
So soteriologically, it can't be just about source. But, but a question about authority that is fair is, does woman need man as a mediator in the organizational chart of authority to get to God? So if it's an authority, is woman allowed to address or speak directly to God? If it's an issue of source, in what way does woman have to go through man to get to God? Which, which do you see, causes us to question, but also put some limits on how we understand these. No, woman does not have to go through man only the man, Christ, to get to God. And no, woman does not have to go through a man, but through the man, Christ, to approach God. So it's not an organizational chart, but I do think it has both source and authority there. Now guys, that's only the first verse, or the second verse, because we ran through chapter 2. Let's read on in verse 4. Here we've heard general principles expressed. Now let's see how they're being worked on in the context of the Corinthian community. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head uncovered, or head covered, I'm sorry, dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. So, so essentially, men, if they cover their heads in pursuing the Lord, they dishonor their head, which is, I think is both ironically an, a, a reference to their actual head as well as a reference to their proverbial relational head, Christ. Women, in the same way, if they pray, if they prophesy uncovered, they, they shame themselves, they shame their head, which is man. But, but let's again explore some context for this situation. First of all, prayer and prophecy, that their presence in this and, and also the upcoming topics, like we looked at communion last week, which, which is after this in, in, in order. And then when we talk about spiritual gifts, we're going to talk about right order of worship and love. Like, like what we're moving into in this section is in reference to how we function together as the church gathered. So, so prayer and prophecy are some clues to that. This is, is not meant to be applied everywhere. It's, it's dealing with specific locations, but the implications that are drawn to this specific problem are wider implications or wider truths. Now, now another thing we have to see here is this passage assumes women have a part to play in worship. And, and again, if you're new here today, if you've not been around church a lot, don't worry much about this because this may be new things to you. But for those of us who've been around church for a long time, who have some understandings of how manhood and womanhood are, are talked about functionally in the church, you, you know, one, this passage is not an argument for women praying and prophesying in worship. That's not the point here. He's not trying to argue this should be happening, but this passage assumes women will be praying and prophesying in worship. That is assumed. The question is, how ought it be done? Now, thankfully, I don't preach 1 Corinthians 14. That's Tim's problem. So he can wrestle with it when we get there. It's, it's fleshed out. It's talked about more. But we have to be honest with this text and say it's there. And he's not saying it shouldn't happen, but he is saying there's ways it should happen. But here's another contextual problem. The exact nature of head coverings is a question that is hugely up for debate. There are three cultures at play here. Um, there's a Greek culture, there's a Roman culture, and there's a Jewish culture. None of them have across-the-board rules for men or women covering their heads, not covering the heads. There's, there's various cultural examples, but there's no clarity as to which ones Paul is referencing here, how it should be done. So, so the hard part is we can't say, in general, women always, or in general, men always. So, for instance, the wording of, of verse 4, men who pray or prophesy with their heads covered dishonors their head, very similar to the way um, the Hebrew is translated into Greek for Haman. When Haman, in, in the book of Esther, he's going down the road in shame, and it says his head, his head is kind of hung or draped down. It doesn't even say covered, but, but the assumption is he kind of covered his head and was walking down the street in shame. And, and so, so, so there's some linguistic potential there. But, but in general, uh, the, there, there could be references here in terms of head covering to shame, as I just mentioned, idol worship in the Roman culture, because sometimes men in, Roman, or in ro worship in Rome, they would cover their heads. Um, it, it could be related to issues of modesty and lust. So, so culturally speaking, hair down for women was, was sort of a, 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 I don't know, a sensual expression. So, so it was considered sort of provocative. And so it could be that, that, that what they're talking about here is, is, is women are seeing a freedom to wear their hair uncovered and, 
And, and Paul could be saying, hey, that's distracting. There's an issue of modesty here. And, and, and again, if this is related to husbands and wives in particular, you could see how that might be awkward for husbands. There's also a chance that head coverings has something to do with expressions of sexuality. So, so long hair on a man culturally was associated at times in culture with homosexuality. Short hair on women or heads shaved at times in their culture communicated sexual preference for homosexuality. And lastly, shaved heads, culturally speaking, appear to at times have been expressions of prostitution. So, so all of that could have been in here. And it's not easy to exactly point to this is what Paul's trying to get to. And I'm not trying to bore you all with all of these things. I'm trying to be faithful to the text here, right? And so while we cannot be sure exactly what these cultural expressions look like or what he was intending to address here, here's what I think is actually helpful about that. This uncertainty, when it comes to identifying exactly what he was referencing when it comes to head coverings, it, it actually helps us realize that maybe that's not exactly the point. So when I started studying this passage, I did not intend or I, I never thought I would get up here this morning and say, women, guess what? You've got to start wearing head coverings again. Never thought I'd get there. And when I talked to the Mennonites, I never thought they would convince me of that. But I thought, hey, they take this seriously. But I did wonder, how is it that we can be serious about the authority of this passage and not get there? That, that, that's, a, that's a question I had. And here is why. Because the, the head covering itself is a culturally specific expression of a bigger issue. And it's not necessary for us to follow today, while the cultural expression, what it expresses, I think is significant to us today. So, so in other words, if we were sure exactly of, of what Paul was talking about, maybe the temptation would be to make that the rule. And by following that rule, we would miss the wider point. But by not being sure about what we put the label on of the rule, is it helps us to dig deeper and say, okay, what was the bigger point? Head coverings were cultural expressions of manhood and womanhood that were being played with to some extent in the Corinthian church. Now, there's a chance that, that the women were, were acting with an over-realized eschatology. They understood that in the new creation, that, that we'll be like the angels who are not male and female. And so they were saying, if we're going to be like the angels then, maybe we're already like the angels now, and there's no point in honoring distinctions of gender. It doesn't matter anymore. Or it could be that these new opportunities that women had in the Christian community, they were pursuing in ways that didn't continue to honor gender distinctions. So again, women praying and prophesying in the church was not necessarily something that would have been culturally acceptable in a wider way. And so maybe they're, they're running at this headstrongly, full bore. And in doing so, Paul's saying, well, be careful, because just because... In Christ, some of these things have changed. It doesn't mean gender is done away with and is no longer significant. So here's another question we can ask from this passage. Does manhood and womanhood matter to the glory of God? And if I'm cor correctly understanding what Paul intended to be talking about, especially if I'm correct in identifying the issue behind the issue, which is the significance of gender in an ongoing way, even in the church, then you can already see that in part, Paul is saying yes, right? These verses say yes, they, it matters. Gender still matters in the church. Manhood and womanhood still do matter to the glory of God. But let's keep going in the passage and come back to this more fully in a few moments. So verse 7, or actually I'm going to jump back in in verse 6. For if a wife will not cover her head, then, and, and you could read this, if a woman will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it's disgraceful for a wife or woman to cut her hair off, um, cut her hair off or shave her head, let her cover her head instead. For a man ought not cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. Again, come on, Paul. Make this a little easier, please. In what sense is man the image and glory of God in a way that woman seems not to be? Paul, clearly, he's about to go back to Genesis 1 and 2. We're going there, and, and, and you can flip there if you would like. But Genesis 1, clearly and quite subversively to its culture, says that both man and woman are created in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. 
And that, that was extremely subversive. Not only to say that all men were created in the image of God, but women too were created in the image of God. That was just not how people understood things in the culture in which Genesis came out of. This was challenging some of the cultures around Israel's norms and understanding of what it was to be human. But in Genesis 2, Paul seems to be going there, and we'll see this in verse 8 and 9. Let's go ahead and read it. He seems to be drawing from Genesis 2 the more specific account for how man and woman were created. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. So the story of Genesis 2 is this, and feel free to flip back there. God is he's creating. He says he creates man, and he formed him out of the dust, and he breathed into him the breath of the life, and man became a living being. Well, then a little later, God said it is not good for man to be alone. And so at this point, God actually brings all of the animals before Adam. And in one sense, I, I think God, I, I think this is describing a real thing. I don't think it's figurative. But I think God never thought, well, maybe we'll get it right with one of these. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe it'll be the, the rhino. I just missed it with the dog. No. But I think even this, one, it's an expression of Adam's headship over creation. Because what does he do? He gives these animal names. But it's also an expression and a reminder of both the createdness of man and woman, but the goodness of man and woman. And so none of these work. The animals are not right. So God puts Adam to sleep, and he takes a rib out of him. And out of that rib, he forms a woman. And Adam wakes up, and, and remember, he kind of says, Whoa! This, at last, is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman, for she comes from man. And so I think what, what, what Paul is looking back on is the uniqueness of how man and woman were created does say something about how we are to understand manhood and womanhood today. It still matters. Gender is not insignificant. It is not an adornment to be chosen by the wearer. But it is an intentional and meaningful endowment by the creator. And gender is good. Gender is good. But let's keep working our way through the passage. Verse 10. This is why a wife or woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. What angels? We're still not going to land on that today, partially out of time, partially because it's not clear. But, but here's another question. The, the, the original reading is this. This is why a woman ought to have authority on her head. Now, now, the questions that arise from this is who is authority? So authority here is used as a noun, but that noun authority always in the Bible refers back to the one who has it. So, so in other words... I never have someone else's authority in the language of, of the Bible. Greek, either New Testament or the Greek translation of the Old Testament. They, they would never say Neil's authority, and what they actually would mean would be Tim's authority on Neil or for Neil. So this would be unique. But culturally speaking, this was not uncommon. For it to be spoken of as somebody wearing authority or a picture of someone else's authority on their head. One of the commentators I read, he gave an example of, of where there's a, a, a wife of a king and the mother of, of the next king who has referenced, a, a picture of her is referenced in which she's wearing two crowns. And those two crowns represent that she is the wife of a king and the mother of a king. And so on her is a picture of authority that is not about the authority she has, but the authority of her husband and son. So, so culturally speaking, and there's other images throughout that culture in which authority was expressed through that image, but that authority was of a king or a ruler in another place. So culturally speaking, it wouldn't be weird to say a woman should have authority on her head and that reference be to her in, in wearing some type of covering, honoring the authority of male headship in how she engages in and participates in worship. Now, others would argue no way. That's not how it's ever used in Scripture. So, we're going to say that this is her authority. And then they would either say that, that, one, it's arguing that there's authority here, the woman has authority. One of the people I read, though, said that it is her authority, but, but the head covering is a willingness of her to express that authority still 
in submission. So, so it's her, her ability. She has the right to express that submission in wearing a head covering. So in essence, she has the authority, and it is her authority to lay down that authority. I thought that was interesting. It's a difficult thing to read. But, but, but again, I, I would partially argue that authority is here. It's not just source. That the significance of gender does mean something when it comes to authority. But I don't know that it's the main point of today's passage. That God, in, in his creative goodness, he, he is saying there is something unique about how man and women are meant to display and demonstrate who God is. And, and our, our faith, our oneness in Christ, our newness in Christ, it doesn't take that away. It restores it. It restores it. Verse 10, I think it's the authority, I, I would argue it's the authority of the woman, or of the man, over the woman being demonstrated by the head covering. The angel's best guess, just so we don't leave you hanging, I, I think many commentators see this as angels who are watching the church, who are overseeing the church, and, and, and it's a testimony to them of good order, as well as it is to us and those around us. That's a guess. Feel free to disagree. Paul, we just don't know. Verse 11 and 12. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. God in his creative wisdom highlights in an ongoing way the mutual inter interdependence of manhood and womanhood. An, an equal emanation from the creative work of God. So yes, I do believe that, that Paul is basing this understanding of head coverings as an expression of right order amongst the genders expressed in the church, meant to communicate to the world. And yet, also in creation, God demonstrates that that type of headship, that type of expression of authority, also has to be mindful of the interdependence also communicated in creation. It has to be there. Verse 13 to 15, let's keep going. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that man wear, if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him. But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair was given to her as a covering. Now again, he, here's the thing, and, and, and we'll say more about this in just a second. But, but Paul here is referencing cultural understandings of manhood and womanhood that he's also saying means something. They don't mean everything, but they mean something. So he's saying, look, in your culture, when a guy wears long hair, you kind of say that's weird. And when a girl wears long hair, you say that's good. And doesn't that say something? Now, I don't think these are lasting. Again, I don't think that women have to have long hair today. I don't think that men can't have long hair today. But I do think this is an interesting affirmation that while gender is something from God, expressions of gender are informed by our community which makes, when we talk about gender, extra tricky, extra difficult. And I'm going fast here. Verse 16, if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. Guys, how we argue matters. And, and, and I want now, in conclusion, to, to sort of draw some things out of this passage we'll spend just a couple more minutes talking about. And when I say in conclusion, I mean of the ideas of the passage, not of the sermon, so just to be fair. In the church, we affirm the uniqueness and goodness of gender as created by God. That's a part of what Paul is affirming here. So gender is a good creation of God. The newness of life in Christ does not do away with or diminish gender, but instead to freeze us, freeze us to live comfortably in gender. Another one of the resources... I read was a book by Kathy Keller, who's the wife of Tim Keller. She wrote a book on, on, and it was more specifically on the roles of women in the church, like in leadership. And in it, she quotes uh, um, C.S. Lewis, something he wrote in 1948. It was a tract called Priestesses in the Church. And here, I'm going to quote her as she quotes him. So, so some of what you'll hear is her, some of what you'll hear is C.S. Lewis. But she says, C.S. Lewis makes a thoughtful point about the difference between the secular world and the church. In the secular world, men and women can and must be treated as unisex, interchangeable, neuters, citizens and workers. However, 
That is a fiction that we are allowed to shed when we return to the world of reality, God's world. There we may resume our real identities as men and women. The kind of equality which implies that the equals are interchangeable, like counters or identical machines, is among humans a legal fiction. It may be a useful legal fiction, but in the church we turn our back on fictions. One of the ends for which sex was created was to symbolize to us the hidden things of God. One of the functions of human marriage is to express the nature of the union between Christ and the church. We have no authority to take the living and sensitive figures which God has painted on the canvases of our nature and shift them about as if they were mere geometrical figures. With the church, we are farther in. For there we are dealing with male and female, not merely as facts of nature, but as the live and awful shadows of realities utterly beyond our control and largely beyond our direct knowledge. Now back to Keller. Lewis' point, point is that we monkey about with gender roles at our peril. What, what did God mean to accomplish by making us male and female? Why not some unisex being or hermaphrodite or able to choose for ourselves whether to generate or incubate life? Why assign different roles? Deep mysteries of revelation hang on our gender and on playing our assigned roles. If God is teaching us something about himself and about our relationship to him, we are all female to God, says Lewis, echoing Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, Revelations 21, 12. And, and he's speaking there of how, how women in marriage are a picture of the church's relation to Christ. And, and therefore a picture for us as men and women. Anyways, dare we edit his choice of, or analogy or metaphor? Do we edit his choice of language itself? In a fallen world, there will be sinful men and women who oppress and even despise one another for their gender. That is why the legal fiction of unisex, interchangeable voters, citizens, employees, and the like, it's a safeguard. But in the home and church, we have access both to repentance and forgiveness, Crucial tools if sinful men and women are to resume their glorious mantles of difference and live together as God's people, fallen, redeemed, forgiven, and forgiving. Guys, we, we should think. We should think about and honor the distinctions of embodied gender. And one point of application this morning is to ask yourself this question. Do you have a biblical understanding of what God intends for manhood and womanhood? Now, now, here's the fun part about that. What kind of minefield do we step into when we begin a sentence with, being a man means, or being a woman means? Those are dangerous and difficult things to define, but they are worth it. And my challenge to you this morning as a listener to this passage is, if you have not allowed your understanding of manhood and womanhood, gender itself, to be informed by Scripture, get there and do that. Because it is important, and it is not forgotten. And furthermore, it is good for us to train up our little boys to desire to be godly men. And it's good for us to raise up our little girls to desire to be godly women. But it's important that we work towards those definitions carefully. Guys, the distinction of manhood and woman can be done rightly and beautifully. If we had more time, I'd have you turn to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 is about marriage uniquely. But Ephesians 5 is a beautiful expression of what headship looks like in terms of how it demonstrates Christ. So men are called to serve their wives as Christ served the church, laying down their lives for her so that they might lift her up, a pure and spotless bride. I've preached that at weddings, and I've, I've said, look at your wife now, in her dress, in her beauty, hours of makeup. Your goal mentally is to keep her as that, spiritually. So there's a beauty that, but women, we were, we, Tim, Ben, and I were at this great conference this weekend, and one of the things, one of the speakers mentioned in, in preaching on 1 Peter, where it talks about the role of, of wives and husbands, is he said, women, you have an important role, because women are called to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. You have an important role in demonstrating through your posture towards your husbands the goodness of submission to Christ. Guys, there's a beautiful picture in marriage and in general given through gender of who God is and how he works.
it can be done right, but it's got to be done biblically. In the Old Testament days, there, there were rules called halakha that were later, about 200 years after Jesus, collected in a work called the Mishnah. And these rules were further explanation on the rules given to the Old Testament Israel in the Bible. So in other words, you had all of the law given in the Bible. And then from all of the law given in the Bible, you, you added other rules to make sure you were following those rules. Now we see an example of one of those rules when Jesus says to some of the teachers, religious leaders, he said, you tell young men that they can say whatever obligation I had to you, I devote and said to the Lord, to their fathers. Young men can say to their dads, whatever obligation I had to you, I can devote to the Lord. And then you free them from their obligation to their parents. And Jesus says what? You dismiss the laws of man or God with the laws of men. So, so here's the danger we run into. When we try to find manhood and womanhood and we go beyond what the biblical text makes clear, we are creating man-made laws. Now, the intention can be totally good, but it can also be really dangerous. And so one thing I would encourage you to do as you're working out a definition of manhood and womanhood from Scripture is this. Say, we exercise manhood and womanhood. We feel it should be exercised in this way. So that may look certain ways in your home. That might look certain ways in your understanding of, of what men can do and can't do and women can do and can't do. But understand, if it's not expl expressly written in Bible, be gracious and gentle in how you present it. Because let's not take what we say or think and make it this. That's always a really dangerous game to play. So we have to be careful because we want to be biblical. And let's be honest, we have to be careful because it's been done so wrongly. It's been so wrongly done. You can't help but listen to The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. Great podcast, really challenging. There's some really difficult things, good and bad, in it. Um, but you can't help but listen and, and hear a warning about how dangerous it can be to talk about men as heads and, and women wearing um, evidences of authority on their head and realize it can be done so badly. Like there can be guys sitting in here today whose heart is not to live like Jesus. Their heart is to live for themselves. They're going to go home and use this to be abusive mentally, verbally, physically, to women who are sitting here and thinking, this is what I'm being called to do. That is not what I'm talking about. Sinful expressions of selfish pride are not what Jesus is talking about. It doesn't look like Christ. Guys, and I was having to read my own notes. One of the things I want to say when talking about headship in, 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 in the home and in the church and, and, and in general is, is, is to those of you who, who, who are women, if it feels wrong, it's good to ask. If it feels wrong, it's good to ask. And, and I say that because, again, I don't want to be in a situation where, where we present rightfully what the Bible teaches, but it's used sinfully to harm or to hurt others. We, we don't want to do that. Guys, abuse of these principles is, is present in our history and in our church. So, so we're taking extra time because we've got to be careful. And men, I want to speak to you in particular. And, and, and again, in some ways, I, we're talking about application, how this looks. But if your first reaction is she doesn't respect me, in quotes, instead of how in this situation can I lead like Christ, then I think we might be missing the point. Do you get the difference? We're angry because she doesn't respect me. I'll be honest, I felt like that. Like in my home, I, like, like I felt a lack of respect before. So I'm not saying it's not out there. But, but, but look at Jesus on the cross, right? If we're supposed to lead and be men with him as our head, he's on the cross, he's looking at the people who are offending him, who are rejecting him, who are disrespecting him, and he says, Father, forgive them. His thoughts are first and foremost of them. Guys, the first question we should ask is, how in this situation can I be like Christ? And women, here is this great question about the testimony of women to the church. Does your posture towards men in general, towards if you're married, your husband, does your posture towards men offer a good launching point for a posture you hope to produce in others towards Christ? Like, think about that. Now again, we have to be careful because men are sinful. Men get it wrong. But in general, does your posture towards men offer a good example of what 
Paul or, or, or what the Bible is calling the church or in the manner in which the Bible is calling the church to respond to Christ. And, and here I'm talking not so much about physical steps or, or actual things you do, but, but attitudes, ways you talk about. Because I, I think that's a really helpful question. But we also have to remember that gender, as it is created and assigned by God, its expression is influenced again by culture. So here's a great question to ask. Is our discomfort with a gender rooted in cultural expressions or, or, or biblical disobedience? And, and that's important because we can oftentimes feel uncomfortable with gender. And, and, and one of the things we need to ask is, is this something that's unique to our culture? Guys in skirts. Kind of weird culturally here, right? Not so weird in Scotland. And there are even mini skirts. So, so we have to ask that. How do we express concerns about gender expression? Do we recognize the goodness of gender, but also its unique ways it's expressed in culture? So, so when your son comes in wearing your wife's high heels, how do you respond? What do you do? Guys, are we censor to the, sensitive to the very real thing of gender dysphoria? Gender dysphoria is a person's disassociation, or, or more specifically, their discomfort with their inability to relate to their physical gender. So, so that's a real thing. There are people out there who are struggling with their, their, their manhood or their womanhood because they don't know how to relate to it or they struggle to relate to it. Are we sensitive to the realness of gender dysphoria? And again, we meet it with the truth of Scripture. But are we patient and gentle with people who are struggling in those ways? Are we grieved by the way in which godly intention has been abused? Guys, if, if, if there's an athletic team that is struggling, do they fire the entire team? Ah, they look to the coach. They look to the one who, who, to whom is assigned leadership. If, if, if what I'm saying is right about a biblical understanding of gender that involves authority, that informs 1 Corinthians 11, 2-16, are we grieved by the way in which godly intention has been abused by sinful men? And, and, and last point I want to make as we conclude is this. There's people in our church in general who would say that, hey, we are comfortable with spanking as a means of punishment in our home, Right? Now, some of you disagree with that, and that's fine. Discipline is good. Discipline is good, but you may disagree with how. Well, even for those family, those who would say, hey, we, in general, we practice spanking our children when there's disobedience. Good thing. But what if, even those of you who practice that, those of us who practice that, what if you have someone in your home in a foster or adoption situation who's been abused? Would that change your use of spanking appropriately? I sure hope so. Because you're leading, you're disciplining, but you're acknowledging how it's been abused, manipulated, and wrongly represented, and you don't want to communicate wrong things to them. So, that being said, are we sensitive to how this gets messed up in our culture in how we express manhood and womanhood? Because this is a really hard topic, and I, I've gone pretty long, but not record length. But I hope, in one sense, behind all of this, we have not forgotten that what is at stake here isn't a fight with our culture. It's a representation of who God is. It's Paul's encouragement to be like Christ and to live for the glory of God. So as hard as this passage is, and as much as you may have sat here today and said, Neil's an idiot, you're partially right. But you have to come to peace in terms with this text. And, and when we do, I don't think it's harmful or, or to our detriment I believe God graciously has provided it for our good. Let me close in prayer. Jesus, we thank you so much um, for, for, for difficult passages, ones we have to wrestle with, like 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 to 16. But God, thank you that all of this is built off of the goodness of how you've created us, the uniqueness of manhood and womanhood. And while, Lord, by your grace, I hope I have, have threaded that needle well in, in representing your word to our people this morning, my, my, my prayer 
My prayer is that anything I've said that is wrong or unhelpful, one will be brought up in good conversation that will draw people more clearly to you through your spirit that works through your word but is also given to your people. But Lord, my prayer is also this. We live in a culture that gets this wrong so much. And in the church, because it's hard to talk about, because we're afraid to talk about it, sometimes we don't. And then we miss an opportunity, and I don't want that. Jesus, I want us as a church to live out manhood and womanhood in the ways that you intended so that we can show people Christ through our uniqueness as men and women and we can live for your glory. God, I pray that our sin, our misunderstanding, would not get in the way of the picture we are presenting of who you are. So Lord, forgive us when it does. And Lord, cover the eyes of the watching world when we get it wrong. But Lord, may we also, going forward in a day and age where this is only going to get harder in our culture, may we be a shining light just by affirming the fact that it is good to be a man and it is good to be a woman. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.